will invite the administration team to come in now. The administration has submitted two response papers. One has to do with the views expressed at the last meeting, and also the administration has responded to the point on suspension of registration of HCP and also HCR. And now they have included a limit of 28 days, and they are going to move a CSA to reflect that. Uh, this is for your reference, members. Uh, I think they have taken on board our views. We'll ask them to go through the papers with us and see if members have questions. And the legal advisor has written to the administration to ask questions about providing service outside Hong Kong. And perhaps we can also ask the administration to go through that briefly with us. And Dr. Fernando Zhang has written in, and uh, that is still or has been pending a response from the administration. This is on the point of substitute decision maker. In fact, the response paper is with us today. So if members do not object, we'll wait for Dr. Fernando Zhang to come before we attend to that paper, because uh, maybe he'd like to respond to the administration's reply. Perhaps we'll first ask the administration to go through the suspension point with us and the proposed CSA. And also, the legal advisor's view on providing service outside Hong Kong. Can the administration please walk us through those papers? Mr. Chan. Thank you, Chairman. On suspension of registration of HCR and HCP. At the last meeting, members and the LA said that we have this suspension arrangement. But then in the bill, there is no time frame for the suspension. And it seems, uh, therefore, it will be unfair. We expressed at the last meeting that according to Cap 1, the Interpretation and General Clauses Ordinance, that we should not do this without unreasonable delay. We have expressed that the safeguard is in Cap 1. But in view of members and the LA's concern, we have studied the issue after the meeting, and we would propose to amend clauses 10 and 22 to provide for a time limit of the suspension period. And initially, it will be for a period of no, not more than 28 days. And in certain circumstances, it can be extended only once for not more than 28 days. After that, the commissioner we have to consider whether the registration will be cancelled or reinstated. This is in line with members' request. That's part A, Paris 2 to 4, in that paper. I think we should have taken members' views on board. Members, questions? Uh, they have proposed to add a time limit of 28 days. OK. We have already scrutinized those clauses, and we are not going to revisit them. If members have no views here, legal advisor, please. With regard to the styling, um, I have only received the draft yesterday. I'd like to take that up with the DOJ later. All right, Mr. Chen. Part B of the paper, clause 29 of the bill, provides that the data and information of HCRs contained in the system may be used as permitted by or other or under any other law. And members asked what we mean by any other law. We explained last time that as drafted uh, in clauses 25 to 29, uh, we have said that in 25, how the data would be used. If we do not have clause 29 to say that um, this should be done uh, any other law, then there would be some inconsistency, and that is why we have clause 29. Clause 29 states that 
uh, any other law that are still in force in Hong Kong will say in force. And this is not possible for us to list all the laws that apply. That is why in paragraph 7 we have stated uh, what those laws are. Uh, say, for example, sections 41 and 42 of the High Court Ordinance, which provide that the court has power to order a person to disclose and produce uh, documents in his custody, possession or power, and the coroner can also uh, require a person to produce any document. Uh, these uh, are examples to facilitate your understanding as to why we want to include the phrase as permitted by or under any other law. And then in the last few lines of para 8, we have said that uh, this is not unique to Hong Kong. In Australia, Canada and the UK and also in the privacy ordinance in Hong Kong, there are similar provisions. In other words, that uh, any other law will still apply. This is to explain uh, the background of the drafting of these few clauses. Any questions, members? If not, we can continue. Mr. Chan, should we now go to another paper? Yes. The legal advisor wrote to us asking us to clarify the surface location um, of HCPs and where the HCP can access the system. In paper bracket 04, we have written back to the legal advisor uh, and her letter dated the 8th of April. And I'm talking about CB bracket 21215 stroke 14 to 15 bracket 04. First, the surface location of an HCP, and that is a private clinic or private hospital, according to clause 17 of the bill. And as an HCP applying to the commissioner to be registered as an HCP, he has to provide a surface location as the registered location. It can be one surface location because he only has one clinic, or if it is a health organization where there are three to five clinics, he can apply in a single application for all the surface locations. And these locations would be the locations for providing health care in Hong Kong. In terms of the provision of health care, and uh, this is an activity performed in Hong Kong by a health care professional. And by way of health care professional, it means a person specified in the schedule, which, which comprises 13 types of health care professionals. So if these two are taken together, the surface location must be geographically in Hong Kong. If uh, an Australian clinic or Canadian clinic applies to us, it will not be allowed. You must have a surface location in Hong Kong before you can ask for registration. And the person must be one of the 13 types of healthcare professionals registered in Hong Kong. This is the first part of the paper. In other words, the service location must be in Hong Kong before a healthcare professional can get registered. This is about the clinic or hospital. And then last time, a member also asked the access to the system whether the person must be in Hong Kong before an access is allowed. We explained last time that uh, supposing a Hong Kong doctor is on leave in Canada, if he uses his computer to access the EHRSS, uh, then he doesn't break the rules. However, the motive must be for attending to a Hong Kong patient when he comes back to Hong Kong. This is what the bill. When you say uh, later, what do you mean by later? Well, I'm using the example that I used just now because last time some members said some doctors would go overseas. Say I have a patient in Hong Kong and he needs my attention. And then I can tell my clinic even if I'm outside Hong Kong, I can instruct my nurses or clinic. So uh, does it have to be later? 
and got you for more. Well, he provided service after looking at the data, so the treatment will be conducted in Hong Kong. He can't do it in Canada or in Australia. Well, he can't possibly be looking at the data of, uh, when he's having the treatment. So, how do you define? For example, that, 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 that the treatment cannot be conducted in Canada. Yes, in the definition of health care, it states clearly that it's supposed to be in Hong Kong. So the treatment has to happen in Hong Kong. So would it be possible that the patient, so say if I'm in Canada and my patient is in UK, well, Assuming that I'm a doctor, so I'm away from Hong Kong, and so is the patient, and his family consults me by calling me. The treatment may not even be performed by me, but it may be conducted by a doctor in the UK. So, for this case, if I were to look at the data online and reply to the family or to reply to the doctor in the UK, you know, talk about you know the past medical history of the patient. So technically, would I be breaching the law? I think, I think you have too, much, uh, too many assumptions here. Even if there's no such system, this scenario happens always that, you know, a doctor may need to, you know, um, consult you know, or provide information to another doctor regarding a patient's case, you know, for the benefit of the patient. There's also a scenario where, as mentioned in paragraph 7, that, you know, uh, maybe the patient wants very much um, um, a doctor to assess his, uh, a doctor, say, in Canada to assess his medical history. So, the patient could indeed ask us for a copy of his medical record and he can fax or or use um uh transmit the this copy um a soft copy or hard copy to the patient or to the doctor so that wouldn't affect the um you know point about you know where treatment is held so legal advisor any concern from you my, you know, given all the scenarios I've talked about, I think my concern is, you know, the bills itself was designed for the provision of medical services in Hong Kong. So as covered by a definition of medical service. For the but the concrete provisions here in the bills do not really uh, reflect the point that the treatment is supposed to be um, conducted in Hong Kong. If you want to make sure or to uh, in ensure that the element of treatment being conducted in Hong Kong is there, would you consider making it clearer? Thank you. Mr. Chen, as I said earlier, in uh, in interpretation um there is uh you know section chapter two of the bill it says that it's supposed to be um, an activity performed in Hong Kong. So all other provisions where the word healthcare appear, uh it would mean healthcare provided in Hong Kong. So I don't see there's a need to repeat the same information. Because healthcare the word healthcare itself already implies that it's supposed to be um provided in Hong Kong. So I think that is that's sufficient for us. I think legal advisor is concerned that the 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 meaning is the hidden in the uh, you know um, interpretation part. Firstly, I don't know how you can provide a clearer idea that the treatment is supposed to take place in Hong Kong. how you can reflect that in the provisions. If you make it very clear, then 
would, for example, you know, um, result in the fact that you no, know, there could be restrictions, you know, um, unwanted restrictions, as you know, suggested in my scenarios. You know, situations are just suggested. You might want to help. You know, uh, go back to the scenario I mentioned. I, as a Hong Kong healthcare provider, provide information to someone who's outside of Hong Kong who's trying to help a patient. You know, it could be good for the patient, but because you know, and would it? You know, is there any chance that you can? You know, would there be any impact if you if we? Um, Provides a clear explanation elsewhere without posing unnecessary restrictions. How can we strike a balance? Thank you, Chairman. I think if I remember correctly, uh, we heard from members that why does you know, for example, uh, if I were in Canada, uh, in Canada or Shenzhen, and you know, is it possible that I couldn't have access to uh, health records of a patient in Hong Kong? So as like other Hong Kong laws, this particular bill can only be effective in Hong Kong. So, it's a Hong Kong healthcare provider providing uh, medical activities, then this um, bill would be applicable to them. But if it's a Shanghai doctor or Canadian Canadian doctor who, in their respective cities, access our data and carry out treatments there, then. This bill, this um, you know, future law would have no um, effect on them. So we want to avoid that. You know, Shanghai or Canadian doctors seeing our uh, patients' medical record and then carrying out the treatment abroad. But this wouldn't affect. You know, uh, but this wouldn't mean that. If a patient has a copy of his own medical record, he is free to show it to any doctor that he trusts, wherever that doctor is, as long as um, that doctor does not get the information through the system. Because if there's any error, uh, you know, made as a result of accessing the data, then if the doctor is outside of Hong Kong, then we can't take any action against it if any, you know, incidents occur. Members did ask about the issue of legal liability. Say, uh, you know, Hong Kong use Shenzhen Hospital. If um, doctor from the hospital access the data, then what are the implications? Can we await the response from the administration on that first? Have you replied? Has the administration replied? Yeah, to us on the issue of legal liability. I think last time we answered it, Kuo Kao Ki asked the question. I explained very clearly last time that there are two aspects of responsibility. One is about the content of the health record. Well, see and me. Secretary told me that paper. Uh, 1504, uh, 15, 14, 15, paper, the questions listed in this or the follow up actions listed here. Um, action C to E have not yet been uh, responded to by the administration. Could you take a look? Do you agree with that? That we haven't received responses to those questions yet? We received this paper on the 10th. On item E, we may not give you a written reply. Yeah, we haven't given you replies for C, D, E. We will give you the answers later on. As I said, last time Dr. Kwok uh, asked the question, and verbally I said that, you know, um, the situation is the same, that the content of the um, medical record falls Within the responsibility of the healthcare provider. If I'm a, a doctor, then I'll be responsible for the record. If I'm a laboratory worker, then I'll be responsible for that as a laboratory worker. In the future, uh, e health record office will be a manager uh, or a system administrator. If there's anything that goes wrong in the system, then the responsibility lies 
with the future commissioner or his office. Last time, I said that verbally. I explained, you know, the、uh, different types of responsibilities. If you want us to give you a written reply, yeah, we can do that. Okay. So I think Nico, I'll find Sir. You know, um, as you know, she's mentioned. I think if members do not object, the、uh, item C D E S in addition to. Um, legal advisors point about services provided outside of Hong Kong. We'll wait for the administration response for CDE first before we look at all the questions in one go. Otherwise, there could be other questions. Ellen Yang, Chairman.、Um, I think there could be two scenarios. The possible scenarios regarding in Chinese it says. You know, healthcare service refers to the、um, services provided in Hong Kong. So I think the, what's of most concern to us is provided in Hong Kong. Whether it could lead to some unnecessary restrictions. Just then we heard. From the ahead, Mr. Chen, that say if a doctor is in, as a patient is in a Hong Kong person is in Canada, and you know he has an emergency and needs to get information from his、uh, e-health record. Say he's in Vancouver, you'll be fine, of course, with the patient to to access that information. You know, instead of his doctor in Canada. You know, accessing the system, the patient himself can get into the system. If the patient has lost consciousness, then, according to、um, the profession here, is it that he can, his son or daughter, can they get the information? Well, that's one scenario. Say that he has a you know emergency, and.、Um, If he's unconscious and he can't access his own information, then he can. And if his family members manage to contact his、uh, doctor in Hong Kong, then his doctor in Hong Kong can get into the system. But the Hong Kong doctor has been consulting. You know,、um, he is away from him, so he can't really save him because the patient is in Vancouver. So is it that?、Um, either by phone or video conference. You know, but what about the other scenario of a patient, you know, who's in in hospital, who's unconscious, and he needs to say go to Vancouver. So there's a specialist in Vancouver, you know, who cannot be found. Similar specialist cannot be found in Hong Kong, and his Hong Kong doctor wants to access the e system to get information、um, for the sake of the specialist in Canada to help with this doctor saving this patient. So, so with all the the two scenarios that I've just mentioned, would that Would these scenarios be allowed under this blue bill? The hat, please. Maybe I'll ask Mr. Wang, Doctor Wang, to supplement later on. But、uh, for your first scenario, say a patient, you know, Hong Kong person, who's joined our system, and if he's unconscious in Canada, of course he cannot. Get a copy of the information of his of his record before his Canadian doctor. Whether his family can contact his Hong Kong doctor, asking the doctor to provide his medical record,、uh, which is might or may not be in the system for the other doctor's reference. Well, this is、uh, something for the Hong Kong doctor to consider. Whether it is the patient's best benefit. To provide information, I also want to explain further later on. But the the other scenario is just the reverse. Like now, you have a patient in Hong Kong who's 
unconscious, and the Hong Kong doctor feels that well, he's not in the best position to help, and he wants to consult a Canadian specialist, uh, but he would need to provide information in the system about the patient. So can the Hong Kong doctor do that? Will the law then be contravened? The second type may be easier because the health care is really provided in Hong Kong. But type 1, the treatment will be in Canada. However, may I defer to Dr. Wong to explain what the doctor considers today before the information will be sent when the patient himself is unconscious. Dr. Wong, thank you. Thank you for that question. Providing health care in Hong Kong as we understand it is not limited to a person or patient lying in a hospital in Hong Kong. The first scenario painted is such that the patient is in Canada and a doctor in Canada is taking care of the patient. But the patient's family is in Hong Kong and he and the family know that the patient has participated in the EHRSS and if the system has to be accessed. Now supposing there is consent from the family and we can assume that the patient has also given consent for the best interest of the patient, but the patient is unconscious. You assume that that would be in his best interest? Well, yes, because without reason we cannot access the system without the consent or request made by the family of the patient, we should reasonably believe that the patient is in a certain condition and the family of the patient can provide sufficient information for us to certify the situation. Then the Hong Kong doctor can provide some health advice to the doctor in Canada or maybe he can do it through the family of the patient. Now if that is the objective, we would view this act as providing health advice. In the end, the surgery may take place in Canada, but the advice will be channeled to the Canadian doctor through the family of the patient. But of course, between doctors, now, even without the EHR system, doctors can still have exchange of information when they are in different places in order to provide the best health care to patients. Of course, we have to look at this case by case, and the questions asked are hypothetical. But uh, we think, in principle, uh, the law should not be contravened in such a situation. Chairman, we lawmakers should, of course, think of all possible scenarios to ascertain whether the bill can achieve the policy objective. Maybe uh, I have really plucked uh, the example from thin air, but as I understand it, that is my responsibility. Listening to Dr. Wong, I like to ask this question. When we delineate or interpret what is health care, maybe we are requiring that there should be a surface location registered in Hong Kong and the relevant healthcare professional should actually be the focus of the issue. When we talk about health care, now whether it should be geographically defined. I think maybe we want to shift the focus so that we can take care of the worries we painted just now. Chairman, Mr. Chen. Thank you, Chairman. We uh, have put down definitions as to who can be eligible for registration under the bill as a healthcare professional. We say that the clinic or hospital must have a service location in Hong Kong uh, before it can become a healthcare provider. So Australian, Shanghai or Canadian clinics or hospitals will not be eligible to be registered in Hong Kong as a healthcare provider. 
Number two, in the bill,、uh, we say that the EHR data are to facilitate HCRs, so the healthcare professionals engaged by them can provide healthcare in Hong Kong. And we say that the healthcare should be performed in Hong Kong. The object is to avoid a situation where a person provides healthcare in Australia and is still able to access the system to view the data. That is what we want to avoid. The objective of the bill is that no one should abuse the system. In order to control that, we want to say the bill will be valid only in Hong Kong, and if data are retrieved from the system, we want to put some restrictions on it. It is not that we don't want a Hong Kong patient to. Receive good treatment in Canada or Australia. If the data from the system are required for that purpose, we just want that、uh, the system should just provide the data in Canada or Australia. We still want a doctor in Hong Kong to forward the information. Now I cannot see where the word healthcare appears in all the sixty odd clauses in the bill.、Uh, I cannot say now at the moment whether we are depriving Hong Kong patients of healthcare when they are out of Hong Kong. Let us、uh, have some time and go back and try to see. Where in the clauses the word healthcare appears?、Um, as I see it, I I think the Present drafting is quite proper. Yes, you should look at the interest of the HCPs, and that is why I am asking these questions. In other words, now you want to limit it to a service location in Hong Kong. You are talking about providing healthcare in Hong Kong geographically. The system should, of course, safeguard. The data it contains, and to do so, the HCR must be personally getting the information from the system, or he must delegate sufficiently to another. And also, it should be done only by a healthcare professional registered in Hong Kong with a service location in Hong Kong. I let you to go through the blue bill. And look at how you seek to safeguard the privacy of information. I want you to focus on the HCP and the HCR instead of the geographical location, meaning Hong Kong. I hope. The safeguard、uh, should be provided on the basis of the HCP and HCR instead of the surface location. If by so doing you can already effectively protect the information, whereas、well, you know there are no boundaries now,、um, since we are in a global village, and people can go everywhere by taking a flight of ten or hours. So, do you really want to restrict the access to information in the system by way of a surface location, a geographical location? I'm just trying to advance this concept. May I also add,、uh, members and、uh, Mr. Chan, if I may look at the Chinese and English definitions or interpretations of healthcare? I don't know whether I have read the interpretation clause correctly. If I may read the Chinese first, well, I think the assessment itself can be regarded as an activity. You don't necessarily require a 
patient to be lying in a hospital bed in Hong Kong. In fact, the diagnosis can be done when the patient is in any place in Hong Kong. But if you um, put in in Hong Kong, now I, I don't know whether I have read the Chinese and English correctly. In Chinese, you say that for the following purposes, um, these are the activities that healthcare professionals do for another person. In Chinese, you give me the impression, the feeling that the healthcare provider must be in Hong Kong. But that is not the case for the English. You say in relation to an individual means an activity performed in Hong Kong. You, you are talking about the activity which must be in Hong Kong by a healthcare professional for an individual. And then the individual may not be in Hong Kong, but the activity must be in Hong Kong. That is the feeling the English version gives us. So can I do it over the phone? It seems um, neither the Chinese or English gives us a comprehensive definition, um, even if the two also read differently. Uh, maybe um, I don't have the correct understanding, but my feeling is that the Chinese and English versions are not the same. Maybe the legal professionals should go back and look at it. As Mr. Leung was saying, the HCP and HCR must both be Hong Kong persons, because at other places you have also defined that the HCP should be someone eligible for registration in Hong Kong, and the HCR, of course, must be a person from Hong Kong. So is this still necessary? Talking about the phrase in Hong Kong under the definition for health care. And uh, in fact, I find the connotation of the English and Chinese versions to be different. Mr. Chen, thank you, Chairman. We will go back and see whether the Chinese and English tally. And Chairman and Mr. Leung, I think we should go back and think about your views. When we drafted the bill, we just like to make sure that the private clinic or private hospital is a Hong Kong clinic or Hong Kong hospital and the registered HCP should be one registered in Hong Kong. Let me finish first. That is why we have said that the institute must be in Hong Kong and the HCP must be a Hong Kong healthcare professional. And we therefore thought that it was quite natural for the activity to take place in Hong Kong. But then you have also raised a point if we use the best interests of the HCR as a starting point. And for some reason, the Hong Kong patient is in Canada. His Hong Kong doctor is there. Uh, but the treatment or activity takes place in Canada. And the Hong Kong doctor can access his notebook for data in the system and then provides the health care for the patient in Canada. Uh, that may be in the best interest of the patient. Uh, please give me some time to think about it. Right, um, I am really going back. If we can look at the definition of healthcare professional and healthcare provider, healthcare recipient, etc., you don't mention Hong Kong. I think uh, you want to mention Hong Kong when it comes to the relationship between HCP and HCR. Uh, when it comes to healthcare provider, of course, the person has to follow the procedures for registration. But actually, the HCR doesn't have to be a Hong Kong person. We don't require the healthcare recipient to be a Hong Kong person because a tourist may need healthcare when they are in Hong Kong. And there may be other people who are on long-term stay in Hong Kong, even if uh, they do not belong to any particular category of persons under the immigration ordinance. But I understand your concern. Let me go back and think about it to see whether um, in any scenarios the HCR's interest may be uh, compromised. Okay, any other questions? Mr. Leong, let me just follow up. I think the focus should be on healthcare professional Healthcare provider. 
I think that will be better. Right now, in clause two, you make use of the word healthcare to introduce the concept of in Hong Kong. Health. In healthcare professionals and healthcare providers, if you can do something there, then the protection of the information and system you know, can lie with these people with a registration address in Hong Kong. That is, they will be the people to be held responsible, and that's something that can be considered. Because then you would have adequate protection that, that these people should they well lay what's in the bill, then you could actually take action against them, and you can do that instead of focusing on the word activity because the definition of health care is in relation to individual means and activity performed in Hong Kong by a healthcare professional. I heard from the um, uh, hat, but I know you understand our concern, but I'm just trying to give you another perspective. I think, um, yeah, Mr. Chen, you know, you're aware of what we are trying to get at. So the two papers provided to us. Any other questions, legal advisor? Fernando Zhang is here, so maybe you can uh, brief us on your query on the um, substitute. Um, director, please. Yes, your response. Yes, I remember Fernando Zhang wrote to us a letter about uh, our bill, whether it would contravene the um, Convention, UN Convention on um, you know, Protection of Rights for People with Disability. So basically, you want to make sure that we can will respect people who are mentally incapacitated, or um, you know, um, people who cannot you know um, handle their own affairs. We did issue a letter to you in response to the question raised by Fernando Germ. Firstly, in our bill. It's only stated that according to the definition, there are several types of people who are qualified to be substitute decision maker. The SDMs have to be people who, uh, when the patient concern is a mentally incapacitated or cannot deal with own affairs, um, you know, who cannot indicate his uh, intention to join the scheme. Um, certainly when that is the case, can the person be the SDMs? That is, the patient himself cannot really indicate his preference or make a, or make a decision. That's when the um, SDM can make a decision on his behalf. Another point I'd like to mention is that for the whole bill, there's no mention that if there's anyone who's uh, mentally or physically incapacitated, when he cannot make a decision, then SDM has to be the person to make the decision instead. Even for a person with some um, mental or physical problems, as long as that person can indicate his preference, then his choice will will always be the have the final say. So the SDM's decision can never override the preference expressed by the patient. So we've set a very high threshold, and we do respect um, the spirit and we never contravened the UN Convention concerned. That is to protect the best interests and rights of the patient concerned. In actual operation, of course, um, um, you know, we cannot actually, of course, um, spell all the details in the law, but we do ask uh, the person who's accompanying the patient, who he says cannot express uh, his own will or cannot make any decisions, then this 
so-called SDM has to provide proof of uh, what he claims. It could be a it could be a court order or um, medical certificate. So only when the proof is given can we accept that person as the SDM for the patient. And the SDM must also be present with the patient concern. And I will ask the patient whether he has any personal preference. If he can indicate his preference to us, then we respect his choice and would not go along with what the SDM says. So that's our answer. Mr. Cheng? Yes, I've heard uh, Mr. Chen's explanation. As for the respect for each person's uh, you know, power to make a decision or right to make a decision, that's clear. But uh, on my point, on explaining uh, what you mean by, you know, not having the ability to handle his own affairs, you haven't really answered directly what you mean by that. You only said that in your reply. You know, uh, as long as uh, you know, the, the a qualified SDM, when he makes a decision for the patient, for such patient. He needs to provide documentary proof to the government that the uh, healthcare recipient is incapable of handling his own affairs. But the difficulty lies in what sort of documentary proof you're talking about. There's no definition given here. Let me give you an example. Say me. Say if I want to um, help my daughter join the uh, e sharing system, I need to g come here with my daughter. What what sort of proof do I need to show you? I haven't gone through any court proceedings or got any court order. If I want to apply for a guardian order, the guardian board may not accept it because it lies outside his jurisdiction um, or his. Um, Terms of reference. So, what sort of medical certificate do I need to produce to prove that my daughter has no ability to handle her own affairs? Say there may be other parents whose children are adults, and yet they are mildly handily, uh, handicapped. So, these children have some sort of ability. The medical certificate may say that he's uh, mildly, mentally handicapped. Does that mean that he's Incapable of handling his own affairs, so there needs to be a clear distinction here, Mr. Zhang. Say if your daughter does not object, then no problem would arise. If the daughter does not want to sign the document, then is that the problem? But the problem is who can make a decision, who can define on which person has the ability or not the ability or not have the ability. Well, let me try to answer anyone. You know, for anyone who comes to the counter of our uh, registration body, we will not try to define whether the person um, is um, mentally or physically incapacitated. I would just assume that that person is qualified or has the ability to make decisions. You know, as long as he can show us their ID, then then we will let him join the system if he wants to. But of course, there could be the scenario where someone comes along and in the company of another person, and that person says, "Well, this person sitting next to me uh, has no ability to express his uh, preference or make any decision. Therefore, I am his qualified SDM." Now, I'm joining the system on this person's behalf. Well, in, if this is the case, then we need to set a higher threshold because we need to respect the choice of the patient concerned. So, in this scenario, the SDM will be required to um, show us some documents proving that the patient sitting next to him or her has no ability to make a decision. That's a very high threshold. He cannot just even he can just he can't just show us a medical certificate. Uh, saying that he has mild mental handicap or he's um, half paralyzed, because even if someone is half paralyzed, he can still talk. So with just a medical certificate, 
proving that he has some kind of disease, that's not enough. The certificate must show that this person has no ability at all to make a sound decision. You know, um, that's a very high threshold that we have set. Since the patient is also present, we'll ask the patient, do you understand, we'll ask them um, if they understand uh, what he means, what we are trying to do. So if the person can indicate what he wants to choose, then we'll, we'll go for his her choice. So, and if the um, patient raises any objection to um, being uh, or having the SDM make any choice for them, or, then then of course that means that person has the ability to make decisions. But if the SDM can show documentary proof that says that the person, the patient, cannot uh, make any decision or preference independently, then then we will act accordingly um, for the purpose of protecting the patient's interests. I think um, the provisions now fully actually um, show respect to the spirit of the UN Convention. Okay, um, in other words, the documentary proof is basically a medical certificate, um, which states, in the words of the doctor, that the um, healthcare recipient cannot make any decision on its own, you know, about where to join the e system. Right? So it, that has it has to be that specific, right? Or is it just that the uh, certificate show that um, the patient concern cannot deal with general matters? Well, I think I think you can. Yeah, that sort of uh, um, description is fine. You don't need to have a certificate specific, specifying they cannot make a decision on whether to join the e system. It's fine as long as the uh, medical certificate shows that. That person cannot make general decisions. We will accept that as proof. But let me add one point here. Why do we ask for documentary proof rather than medical certificates? Because we don't want to um, make it too narrow, the make the definition too narrow. Because sometimes there could be some court documents that provide the same kind of proof, you know, that the person, the patient concerned cannot handle, you know, general Affairs. So that's why we use the wordings documentary proof instead of doc uh, instead of um, certificates. So I think you can actually um, make it clearer in the code of practice. You know what sort of documents will be accepted. Yes. And how about you know um, patients who maybe cannot go to your office in person, or people who are hospitalized or confined to a nursing home. Or you know who actually maybe um, not have access to anyone who can accompany them to your counter. So for these sort of patients, how would you deal with them? Yes, I think we discussed this last time. I think if, I think um, the scheme would be relevant to such patient when he has to see a doctor when he is getting medical treatment. He must be at the spot, so he may not need to. Uh, you know, um, have joined the scheme months ago. Uh, you know, and uh, with the SDM helping that person make a decision, decision, he can join at the spot when he's getting medical treatment. So it won't happen, you know, as you might fear that you know, um, a person, you know, could just suddenly come up to you at uh, in an office saying that you know, he's the SDM for someone who's who cannot, uh, you know leave a nursing home or who's confined to hospital. So that that wouldn't be the case and we will actually ensure this protection for the patient concerned. Chairman, in other words, when the patient say say an elderly patient at a nursing home and he's uh, getting a consultation again as part of his medical treatment, and the doctor for this elderly patient, are you assuming that these uh, healthcare providers would automatically know? 
you know, um, whether, you know, or, or, find, or try to find out whether the elderly patient has joined the e-system. And the doctor will take the initiative in, you know, finding or making the application for an a SDM so that the patient can, you know, be registered. Is that what can possibly happen? I think Elderly people may already have dementia. They may be in an institution, and the family does not exactly take care of the elderly person. When he needs health care, does it mean this will automatically be kick-started? Two scenarios. If an elderly person comes to see a doctor, the elderly person comes in, and I may tell him, you are not in the system. So would you like to join? If I say this to him, the elderly person will be making a decision. There is no SDM because he has the capacity to do it. And if he says yes, I can register for him. And then in another scenario, the person may be paralyzed. The person will not come along to see a doctor. The nurse or person in charge of the elderly institute may bring him in. So if at that moment he is not in the system, then the person accompanying him, uh, if this person wants him to uh, join, then he has to provide documentary proof to say that the person, the elderly person, has no ability to make a decision, and this person from the elderly institute will act as the SDM. So the SDM is not the doctor, but the person accompanying the elderly person. Um, uh, what are the loopholes in your mind, Dr. Zheng? I am afraid elderly persons or disabled persons may not have all the information. You mean they may object? Well, they may not object, but they don't know that they can join. Well, unless they don't see a doctor. Well, they go see a doctor, but the difficulty is the person accompanying him may just be a worker. Normally, it will not be a nurse because that would be too expensive. It may be a contract worker doing the escort. It may be an older woman, and the older woman has not heard about the HR. So how can she say, I can be the SDM? Well, of course, she will not be the SDM, but I think Mr. Chan is saying that uh, maybe the elderly person is uh, unconscious or paralyzed. Uh, otherwise, is very probable that uh, he will say yes. But who will ask the question? Is it the doctor will ask the question? You mean all HCPs will ask that question? If he sees a patient who has not joined the system, is that the case, Mr. Chen? We, of course, would like to encourage Hong Kong people to join the system. In the hospitals, of the HA and DH, there will be counters set up and the initial stage to encourage registration. But the elderly people will not go to the counters. The first person they see will be the doctor. Will the doctor say, uh, look, you're not in the system. If you join the system, it would be much more convenient and explain to him. I'm sure the doctor will have a script uh, for explaining the system to the patients. So would someone do it, the doctor or the nurse, so the old man can make a decision? Dr. Zhang is concerned that elderly people, uh, some of them, may argue back. But barring that, it will still be for the decision to be made by the elderly people whom we should respect. So is it that as long as someone pops the question, the problem will be solved? Well, when the bill is passed and the system will be up and running, I will encourage staff of the HA and DH to 
ask that question if they should see anyone who has not already joined. But I won't write it into the law because I think you will understand that in the public system, the workload is already extremely heavy. So I will not stipulate it in the law for our staff to have to register people who have not joined. We will not go to that extent, but as other welfare or health care policies of the government, we will encourage our staff to promote it to patients. Well, I'm just worried, Chairman, that elderly people just may not know about the system. And two, you say someone can explain things to them, but they may have uh, dementia and they may have other illnesses. So they cannot make the decision for themselves. I would think that these people will then not benefit from the system because they will have a slim chance of joining given the present proposed implementation method. You seem to be asking for proof. Well, usually you will not do it using a court order unless there is uh, uh, arguments over the assets or in other scenarios where there are uh, guardians. But uh, in most cases, they will not belong to this type. And when you ask for proof, it would be usually up to doctors to prove that the person is incapable of handling his own personal affairs. And actually, this is not easy at all. Today, you pay a revisit to the orthopedics department. You can't ask the um, orthopedic doctor to prove that this person is incapable of handling his own affairs. Therefore, I think on your platform, you have to take care of the old and frail who cannot make decisions for themselves. I'd like to add a point. Supposing these people first go to a public hospital, even if they don't join the system, their health record will still be with the HA. It's just that the private doctors cannot access the record. I think that is the concern. Dr. Zheng, the HCP at HA or DH can still access the record. It is just that in case the elderly person goes to a private practitioner, then the problem will arise. In fact, the public hospital doctor may not pop the question because the doctor can always access the record. And the doctor may think the elderly person may go to a public hospital every time. So there is a, or maybe an impact. It's just that. It is not 100% that this person is not protected. Because if he usually goes to a public hospital, then the impact will not be very big. Yes, I understand. This morning, we may think that the old and frail usually patronize public hospitals, but the government is going down the route of privatization. Whether we are talking about the voluntary supplementary health scheme or the vouchers, for elderly people to get a place in a private home. So you can see that we are moving in that direction. And today, this may not be a big problem, but it may evolve into a big one later. If the administration can promise that in the code of practice, you can encourage HCPs to do it, I, I think Dr. Zhang is not exactly asking that you write into the law for doctors to ask that question. but. You can state in the code that you would ask staff at public hospitals to promote the joining um, in the system. Do you think that will suffice? Well, that is important, Chairman. But to parents like us, if we always have to go to a doctor to get proof that someone 
does not have the capacity to live alone or handle his own affairs and then take that person to your counter to make the application, I think you have to be careful about the procedures. Do you require a young child to present himself? Well, usually it is up to the family or guardians to say yes. Well, yes, but you may already have a lot of things to attend to. Say it will already be very difficult, for example, for us to take an adult child who is uh, handicapped in some ways uh, just to go out. And you can imagine the degree of difficulty. But maybe doctors at the institutes can help do it, uh, and they do not necessarily have to go to public hospitals because those are also HCPs, if there is an HCP in the institutes. According to the bill, the institute will be an eligible HCP and they can register. When we answered Dr. Zhang's questions last time, we said that we will step up publicity and we may go visit the institutes to promote the system to the persons in charge and also the inmates. So we can do something to help them register. But then their account will not be activated until uh, the first visit to a doctor. Once it is activated, the patient will be there. But the doctor can activate it if the institute is very cooperative. And if all the inmates have given consent to join, then they do not have to present themselves to a doctor before the account can be activated. Okay, Chairman, if that's the case, well, in fact, the institutes can be the SDMs. No, 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 the SDMs may be the HCP. The inmates will be consulted. And if consent is given, in, in fact, if there is no uh, objection, then the registration would have been done. You mean you do not require the person himself to present himself to a counter in the hospital, but the HCP who has got the consent of the inmate uh, will already be able to do the registration. Is that right? Do they have to fill out a form? Let me start, Chairman. We may go to an elderly institute. The institute management is an eligible SDM, but the prerequisite is that the patient or inmate cannot make a decision for himself. Actually, many elderly people can still make simple decisions, even if they are in an institute. If elderly people in an institute can still sign, they can make a decision, then in fact it is actually the elderly persons who are making the application themselves. You mean you can send forms to the institute? When the outreach teams visit the institute, if elderly people can sign, then it would mean that they are making the decisions themselves. Unless there may be a handful of inmates who are totally immobilized, then the institute may act as the SDM after supplying documents to prove that the inmates indeed cannot make decisions for themselves. And uh, that will be recorded. That is what is going to happen on the ground. Miss Lee can add about the filling of forms. Let me clarify something. So-called registration, um, it doesn't have to take place at a specified location. You can do it at the office for registration. And HCPs in the system can also do the registration for patients in private hospitals. And those HCPs in the system can help to do registration because it's just a, a computer process. You need to import the 
input the information to the computer and then you uh, transmit the personal particulars to the relevant persons. And there will be mobile registration teams going to the institutes to do promotion and also registration. The registration doesn't have to happen at one place. It can happen at the institutes, at our hospitals, and also our mobile teams can help do that. It is just that we need to see the patient at registration. You cannot just say, I am registering a person who cannot be proved as to the identity. So it doesn't have to be one designated location. There can be other locations. And we also outreach you know, to people to get them registered. So there are lots of channels. Mr. Chen, maybe you can consider in the future, um, you know, code of practice, try to address this concern, make things clearer. And uh, so it will be convenient for people, you know, or who may not have the ability to make decisions for themselves, you know, um, so they have the chance to join the system earlier, just to make things more convenient for them. And for institutions, if possible, you know, you know, there are large number, so that there are large number of residents there that you know who can get timely help. Okay, so then let's move on. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Zhang. Okay, Kwakaki, you just stepped out, and uh, Fernando Zhang used the time. So now is to turn to ask your questions. Yes, Justin, I heard from Mr. Chen. Um, his answer is, I think the main question is if the service provider is overseas and tries to assess the patient's patient on the system under the current bill there is no protection as you said repeatedly you know we are talking about services or activity performed here if a doctor uh, assesses patient's data overseas uh, is there any chance that he could breach the law and also if there is um patient overseas who's not receiving local medical treatment and yet you know I heard about you know from NNL similar scenarios so uh, the patient who wants to um, you know get service through a local doctor and that local doctor you know can access the information as long as he has the patient's registration number right wherever that doctor is so maybe um, he can look at the information of, um, you know, um, family information of a family member. You know, sometimes family doctor, you know, they look at or consults, uh, you know, um, extra provide consultation service for the whole family. And if one member gets sick, and when the family member is unconscious, um, the family member. Um, you know, may ask doctor to provide information about that patient. For example, someone who suffers a stroke overseas, and um, one family member may find a family doctor, and uh, and the family doctor may actually assess the information and pass it on to the doctor in Canada. Would that be a breach of the law under the current provisions? I think. Indeed, I think um, the administration told us already that um, the main issue really lies with the definition of um, healthcare services or medical services. Um, the um, current definition only refers to healthcare services provided in Hong Kong. It doesn't really matter where the um, healthcare providers are physically, whether they're in Hong Kong or not. I think, from what I heard from Mr. Chen just then, he had said that the whole purpose is not to really prevent you know those scenarios um, you suggested because the prime concern is the best interest of the patient mr chen has promised to look at the provisions and see whether they can you know avoid uh, creating the impression that um, you know 
you know, that that could be uh, you know unnecessary restrictions. Do you want to supplement, Mr. Chen? So any any possibility of the law being breached, you know, unwantingly? Yes, uh, I'll actually tr address this question in our reply next. Um, th three things here: we do hope that the healthcare provider is in Hong Kong, and secondly, we would like to see that the healthcare professionals, according to our uh, bill, is the thirteen types of registered healthcare providers in Hong Kong. The purpose of these provision is that you know, the law will give us the power to take any action against uh, healthcare, healthcare professionals who. Uh, Commit an offense or break the law. You know, um, the healthcare treatment should also be um, conducted in Hong Kong. But of course, um, the overall concern is the interest of the patient. Whether this scenario raised by Kwok, Mr. Kwok, or Mr. Liang, you know, if the treatment itself does not take place in Hong Kong in case of emergency. Say if a patient happens to be in Canada and the doctor is in Canada, then would the doctor be breaching the law? I think I will, in our written reply to members, give you a more precise answer. Yes, Chairman. If the uh, service provider, uh, as the um, have said, is among the thirteen types, one of the thirteen types of professionals. Listed in the schedule, then I think that we can follow the direction of allowing that provider to act. Because a locally registered healthcare provider still needs to be held responsible, right, for their services no matter where he access the system. Uh, we are talking about, you know, the the impact of the system, but if we know what the responsibilities of the professions, professionals are, even if, well, if um, treatment is going to take place overseas, and if the doctor passes information to, you know, a doctor abroad who is in a position to treat the patient, whether in, um, you know, Canada or not, as long as the Doctor really complies with the law that is after his access information in the system. He he still can be uh, arrested if he breaks any law or commits any offense. But if he's doing it to help the patient get the best interest uh, to get the best treatment, then I think in whatever amendment you you may, um, that should be allowed because that should be the spirit, right, in line with the spirit of the law, right? Yes, I think that's the spirit. But my view is that it's just because of the way that um, the provisions are written, because it comes under the section on health care, then you know, we would keep thinking about what would be the possible scenarios that could bridge the law, you know, if the health care providers are not in Hong Kong and so forth. We are talking about not just offering treatment but diagnosis, uh making records you know, diagnosis and so forth. So we're just concerned where there could be restrictions, unnecessary restrictions on the healthcare providers. But uh, we've heard from Mr. Chen that what they want to restrict is that make sure that um, the healthcare providers governed by this bill is the providers operating in Hong Kong. So maybe you can see where there's a way to make your um, what's in the law even clearer. Okay, Mr. Kwok, we'll follow that up. Okay, so, well, I've got two more meetings. Yeah, two, two. I know I know there are four meetings happening at the same time today. If there's no objection, then let's go back to um, clause by clause scrutiny, part three. Mr. Chen, would you like to carry on? Yes, I just want to make a suggestion. Last time in our last time after our meeting, in item C, we um, you know you um, item C in the paper, you asked for further information on um, code of practice um, and other similar organizations. So where there are other data, we're still in the process of collecting data. And that is related to thirty three, thirty four. I suggest that. 
when we go to um, section 52, 53, uh, we will talk about the composition of the research board. I think by then we will, we will have provided the information for items uh, C. Then, so shall I? Shall we skip? Shall we skip? I think let's talk about that when we discuss or scrutinize the provisions for 53-54. Yes, because we, we're still waiting your answers for item C and D in the last paper. In that case, we'll skip 33-34 and, yeah, and go to 35 first now. So, Mr. Leung, we're now at section 35. We've skipped 33-34 for now because we that hinges on further information to be provided by the administration. So 34 is about Division 4. Um, so this is about the um, private or pri private or public health care providers' responsibility, um, you know, safeguards of electronic health record sharing system to make sure that uh, it will not impair the security or compromise the integrity of the system. So this is uh, what we require from the participating healthcare provider. I need to. Well, I want to ask a question here. First, um, you talk about reasonable steps in this provision, and secondly, your wording about impair the security. Well, you know, healthcare providers are not IT specialists. They don't have all the knowledge needed. What do you mean by reasonable steps, and what steps, you know, uh, would be needed? And if, for example, if I turn on the computer. You know, I just let it on, and if there's any system problem, you know, there could be things that are beyond my control, like, um, you know, I could actually uh, have virus uh, attacking my system without me knowing, or my the system can actually um, cause a lot of um, destructions using my name. And some system have uh, security software, and some don't. If I haven't used any security software, then would I be uh, held liable for not using certain security softwares? You know, if I, you know, and if I actually end up hurting the entire health record sharing system, then I will be, um, you know, held for largely responsible. So, can you give us some more information on what the user needs to do? Otherwise, the healthcare providers could, you know, uh, be in the trouble, you know, not knowing, um, you know, what risks they might be taking. Because you no know, experts can provide you any sort of guarantee of not impairing the security of the system. Well, reasonable. Yeah, what do you mean by reasonable? I'd like to hear from you what you think on that. Is it that they? Of course. Do you mean they must install uh, the? Uh, Anti-malware software, or would you provide them with the anti-malware softwares? Yeah, what sort of steps they have to take, and what are the legal responsibilities involved? Or would that be covered in other sections of the bill? Here, he just says that they must take reasonable steps to ensure their security. But what if they haven't taken some steps? What would be the consequences? Well, I will answer Ms. Chen to supplement later, but now I will just say a few things. If uh, a clinic or a hospital has not taken reasonable steps and we suspect that um, you know, that results in an impairment of security, I think you may recall last time we said that we may have to suspend the qualification of the provider or in a serious case we need to um, uh, actually revoke their registration. So, so Chairman just said. So, 
you're not saying that if you haven't taken any reasonable steps, then you may be arrested or you know prosecuted, because assuming that the person has not taken some steps. Would they would they have to shoulder any responsibility? As you said, is it that the maximum penalty would be uh, suspending their registration or revoking their registration status? Is that the um, well, that would of course mean a serious blow to their business? But the um, provider wouldn't have to shoulder other um, responsibility, right? Yes, unless um, the result is. Um, that it actually results in uh, very very serious offenses mentioned later in the bill, um, that which could lead to imprisonment. If it's not as serious a consequence, then what would happen may that we would suspend the registration of the provider. But we understand that private clinic practitioners may not be computer experts. That is why we apply the concept of reasonable steps. May I defer to Ms. Jang to tell you about our actual requirements? We look at things from the angle of the doctor to try to facilitate him to follow reasonable steps in our eyes. When we write the guideline, we have had discussions with private doctors and clinics, and that is why we can put down a list of requirements. I can give you a feel, a, a touch of what we expect them to do. If there is a login password, it should be just for one person. No two persons should share the same login ID, and the computers should be placed in such a way that people from outside the clinic should not be able to touch the computers. Uh, these are very reasonable requirements. As for the antivirus software, that is extremely important. We require the private clinics to install antivirus software because um, otherwise there will be a lot of risks. We believe if we explain things to them in detail, they will certainly install it. Uh, it is quite common now, and uh, it is well accepted. I understand what Ms. Jang is saying. Number one, I'd like to ask whether these requirements will be expressly provided. Yes, later on in the guidelines, these will be provided. And secondly, is it that later on uh, the committee will be able to discuss such guidelines? Uh, in other words, whether the users will be consulted. That is important. And number three, the structure. You are going to formulate a user guide, but I like to know whether it will be something rather transparent so that people can use it. And you talk about technical requirements. I'd like to ask whether later on there will be technical support provided. Say you ask people to install an antivirus software, it's all right, people can buy it, but would you advise which software will be desirable? Will you list uh, six different softwares, including Norton, for example, so people know they would comply with your requirements? And also, will you be developing your own procedures so that uh, people will automatically have information safeguarded if they lock in in a certain way. Ms. Cheng, it's a very good question indeed. If you talk about uh, software, indeed, yes, we have developed a software with universities for the protection of data. If uh, it is just a GP clinic, probably they will need to install the software we have developed. Is it uh, going to be provided for free? Yes, but it is not mandatory. It is mandatory because 
the system is a closed system. Not everyone can log in to the system. You must have installed that antivirus software before you can log in. So that is the basic security that will be provided. Well, that is good. We were talking about um, antivirus software. They will also have to install it. Is it that if they do not install it, there will be a problem? Well, maybe it's not going to affect the system. Well, yes, if uh, their own computer will be affected, that's all right. But uh, you are telling us that this is not a strict requirement. Well, people, of course, want to protect their own system. But we are talking about the EHR. So you are saying that the software has to be installed before the EHR will be accessed. And then talking about reasonable steps, you mean there will be a transparent procedure for those to be decided. Is that right? Actually, in the government structure, there are many committees. There is a technical committee that involves private doctors and private hospitals. And uh, that committee has discussed these guidelines. I also know that doctors are also worried about the security of their own computer systems. There will be materials to a system to understand the system and how security can be guaranteed. Well, maybe my question has already been answered. You talk about the integrity of the system here. As you said, if I am a private GP or if I operate a private hospital, if my own system is corrupted, still, if I have installed your in software, the integrity of the EHR system will not be compromised. Is that right? So is there a very slim chance or actually no chance of corrupting the central system? Is that right? Say if my own system is attacked by a virus. Now you say this is a closed system, right? The information is not stored in my computer, but at the central level, is that right? Yes, you're correct. I don't know what can be done to compromise the integrity of the system. I can give you an example. If I were to affect the EHR, I might have to log in my account and then I would make changes to the data. Well, that is something I would do on my own initiative, and I believe that would amount to a contravention of the law. But without knowing it, does it mean uh, basically uh, there is only a very slim chance of corrupting the central system? Yes, indeed, but we can think of a scenario if there is no antivirus software installed, his own EHR data could be scrambled, and if it is uploaded to our central system, then our central system's integrity will be affected. That is why we ask uh, private clinics and hospitals to really safeguard their own systems. Well, that is why in Clause 42, you talk about um, a person committing an offense if the person knowingly impairs the operation of the system. Under 35, you only say what should be done, but uh, Clause 42 talks about the liability. We'll be asking you that question as to what you mean by knowingly. You talk about knowingly without stating the objective. Well, if knowingly um, I, I do not have the software in the computer system and I should know that my computer system is corrupted, does that amount to knowingly? Or at what point would I be regarded to have committed an offense? Would you like to answer the question here or would you like to wait? Mr. Chen, is it that uh, we should take it up here? Well, I would propose that we wait till we go to 40 to 46 because I'm sure relevant questions will crop up. On 35, any other questions? Yes, Alan Leong. Division 4 of Part 3. Is it superfluous? 
because, as Mr. Chan said, the offenses are in Part Five, right? And the offenses in Part Five do not make use of the same diction. Say, in compromise the integrity of the system. For example, in forty one, forty two, forty three. You don't see those words, so is this division independent of Part Five? Is this another criminal offence? This is not clear. In terms of law drafting, may I ask the experts what kind of arrangement is this, Mr. Chen or Miss Chai? I can ask Miss Chai to comment. But、uh, as we said, contravention of clause thirty-five may not be a criminal offence because the extent will not be so serious that、uh, it would amount to the six new offences. But without discharging responsibilities under thirty-five, there may be suspension or revocation of registration. Well, if that's the case, why don't you state in thirty-five? What you said just now, that、uh, this is related to suspension or revocation. Under twenty-three, suspension or cancellation. Twenty-three, one A Roman one. If you contravene a provision of this ordinance, there may be suspension or cancellation of registration. And that would include security requirements, Chairman. From a lawmaker's point of view, I must raise this query because if you draft 35 like this, those who are affected by 35 will not know what they should do. They don't know what this amounts to. As lawmakers and gatekeepers, we cannot allow this. To happen, we cannot allow the bill as drafted like this to pass because you don't know what these people caught by thirty-five should face, and whether there is any objective criterion, and whether clause thirty-five will create consequences that can be. Uh, faced by the victims, we must、uh, do the gatekeeping here, Miss Chai. Thank you. In terms of diction, in thirty-five, we say does not impair the security or compromise the integrity of the system. In fact, the same phrase can be found in other clauses.、Uh, we are talking about the submission of documents. It is in fifty-two e. Fifty-two e. Are you talking about fifty-two or fifty? Fifty, bracket two, and e. Ah,、uh, impairing the security or compromise the integrity of the system. Then, in that case, the commissioner can require the HCP to submit documents. And then, as Mr. Chen said, under twenty-two and twenty-three, the same set of words have appeared. Under twenty-two, it is bracket one e. The registration may impair the security or compromise the integrity of the system. And then, under twenty-three, bracket one e, again. The registration may impair the security or compromise the integrity of the system. Under thirty-five, as we said, this does not directly point to an offence, but at least this is a requirement that has to be complied with if、um, 
this is failed, there will be consequences, as I um, indicated. And may I interject? Under 22, 23, and 50, bracket 2, you have written the consequences of non-compliance. Then why do you still need 35? It doesn't have any meaning. Chairman, I was saying you are asking me to take up liability, and I can easily link it to an offence because this is a bill. So if your legislative intent um, is different and um, you're just asking, you know, asking um, the health provider to perform an activity and something that's relevant for the code of practice, uh, you know, that they should take reasonable steps in accordance with the code of practice, then it's not so much a, a, an obligation. I don't know what Adam Young thinks. So, but I think the provision now would easily, you know, cause people to associate it with um, Part Five. Having heard from Miss Chai, it um, suggests it seems that uh, actually um, Part Two already mentions the consequences. So, is this section really necessary? Yeah, when I saw this sentence, I had a feeling that uh, you haven't told us what the penalties could be, even though I would be held responsible. If I haven't looked at the other sections, and indeed the other sections cover the um, possible consequences like cancellation of registration and so forth. So is, is it necessary for, to have this section here, or should we move this part to the code of practice? That would be enough because you will have you will make similar provisions in the code of practice anyway, Mr. Chen. Yes, I said um, the consequences of violation of um, 35 would be what's mentioned in clause 22-23, no cancellation or suspension of registration. So violation of um, section 35 would not necessarily lead to um, criminal consequences or offenses. But um, as a healthcare provider, besides having the right to upload and accessing information in the system, we do um, want to include the provisions, their responsibilities as well. In 35A, we would actually um, include one more requirement for the providers, but I would like to ask my colleague, Ms. Lee, to Supplement on our consideration in drafting this particular section. Yes, Ms. Lee, I think the entire bill wants to um, stipulate the uh, requirements that need to be complied with. Otherwise, um, you know, as mentioned in says clause 45 and 46, what would the um, legal liabilities would be if they're not complied with? And for section 35. Uh, it's because um, there's this concern raised by the privacy commissioner on um, you know additional requirements for the provider. We note that uh, 23 bracket A states that uh, for any violations of any provisions in the bill, um, there could be cancellation or according to clause 22, uh, suspension of the registration. So if there are requirements in the bill, that the provider uh, violate or have not complied with, then they would be found breaching the law. So we need to st we need to um, specify the requirements per se first, and clause thirty five and thirty five a that we're going to talk about are requirements for the providers. Therefore, there's a need for us to specify what our requirements are before we can you know um, bring in the Consequences mentioned in clause 22 and 23. Any now? Any legal opinions from you? Well, we've got a number of experts here. I want to listen to the experts too, but 
as a legislator, I want to make a query. For anyone who would, could be held liable for legal consequences, you know, you need to tell them what the possible scenarios could be. There needs to be a given situation. And the given situation, you know, from the perspective of the legislator, we need to know what that situation is. Say in clause 22, as our draftsman said, bracket 1, bracket E, um, the wording security or compromise the integrity of the system are used. If you feel that there's a need to define what impaired security means or you know as administration you know what your considerations are when it comes to compromise the integrity of the system you could insert a definition Provision here, that's perfectly understandable to me, because then that will provide the situation. You know, in um, clause 22, in relation to suspension of uh, the provider's registration, you are providing a definition so that the people to be affected will understand what they, what risk they could take or run into, and. Um, Clause 51, the code of practice, you can also insert in a definition of the concept involved. Now, just look at 35 by itself, clause 35, then it would seem a bit uh, puzzling to me. Maybe it's because of my ignorance, but if I'm ignorant, then I'm willing to be told in what way I'm ignorant, in what sense. I don't see why um, in Clause 35 there has to be this separate, you know, section that is not really well connected with the provisions above and below it. I just want an answer on, you know, in what way I'm being ignorant. Mr. Chen, I think you may need to look into this clause more carefully, you know, um, you need to provide with a clearer definition here. Uh, one more point here. Even though you mentioned that you will talk about 35A, but to me, I think 35A to be discussed, you know, it's just put there for convenience sake. I don't really see. I don't see really uh, why they're put together, and also the um, title for the um, provision above. Thirty-five A actually is independent from thirty-five. I don't see they both need to be put together. Mr. Chen. Okay, the. Um, Version you have before you under Division Four Safeguards of e Health Record Sharing System has only one section. That is Section Twenty Five uh, or Clause Twenty Five, asking the provider to take reasonable steps to uh, ensure the uh, medical record system does not impair the security of the central system. So this is. Our requirement for the health provider in terms of um, system security, and this really ties in with clauses 22 and um, 23, um, the scenarios under which the uh, registration could be cancelled or suspended. That is, for example, if there are contraventions of uh, provisions of the ordinance or code of practice. So, with this um, 35 you know, clause 35, then. It would actually give the providers an idea of, um, you know, uh, what liabilities the providers could have. So I think it ties in 
with the uh, clauses 22 and 23, but haven't listened to members' concern. If we delete clause 35, what would the consequence be? I would think of it that way. If there's no clause 35 and just rely on 22, 23, or 51 alone, can I uh, take action against a provider for endangering the system? You know, well, it's kind of endangering. Is it, uh, you know, kind of events that are not as serious as that covered by clauses 21 to 46. So I need to what could um, actually be covered or not be covered there. So you can look at yes, um, the consistencies as well, and and look into the um, section again. Yeah, we will think about it, Chairman. Um, I think I agree with your summing up just then. But my other question is impairment of security and compromise of integrity. These two concepts, are they very obvious? Or is it that all readers, when they look at this provision, you know, this um, clause in the bill once it's passed into law, when people look at it, would these two concepts necessarily be understood by the reader. At least I personally don't really know what we mean by impairment of security or what it, what we mean by compromise the integrity of the system. I really don't know what they mean. Yes, same for me. Yeah. So if, if the distinction is not clear or the meaning is not clear, then and yet you know the uh, if it's not clear, then the legislators and the draftsmen would have to um, bear responsibility for creating unclear clauses. So should we make it clearer what we mean by that here? If you talk to or if you uh, compare it with the situations mentioned in um, or, the, or the what's in the code of practice mentioned in clause 51, you can, you can tie in with the code of practice there, but at least you need to uh, make sure that the operator or the general public will know what you mean here. Otherwise, people will accuse us of being negligent in our law drafting process. Yes, you know, technology changes so fast, and so the, you may have to come up with a way um, to provide more flexible guideline and to give us the confidence that the guideline in future you know, the procedures involved and so forth are reasonable. So maybe it's something that you can look into as well. I don't know how to define this. You know, the definition could be very broad, but if you have a clear definition, then, you know, of course, it could lead to other issues. But please look into it again, yes. Look at what other uh, jurisdictions uh, can think. Do they have similar concepts? Like, like in Australia, yeah, maybe you can provide us with a more detailed reply and un explanation so that we can rest better or assured. Thirty-five. Okay, with no further problems with the uh, clause thirty-five, I don't think we have enough time to discuss thirty-five bracket A. So I think there's no other um, business that we need to deal with. The next meeting is on April 28, 10.45 in the morning for the next meeting.